A new report shows some of the world's richest people hid more than $30 trillion in offshore tax havens. Should these tax avoidance institutions be allowed to exist? And why do wealthy individuals hide their money abroad? Is it greed or lack of trust in their governments? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to Inside Story. I'm Stephen Cole. A couple of weeks ago, we learned that Barclays traders had been deliberately lying about fixing LIBOR interest rates to maximise their own profits on currency dealings. A week later, we heard that one of the world's biggest banks, HSBC, has apologised for allowing drugs gangs to launder billions of dollars. Now, we're told the super rich and their families are hiding away as much money as the combined GDPs of the US and Japan are staggering 32 trillion dollars. Yes, that's 32, followed by 12 noughts. Out of an estimated world population of 7 billion people, just 10 million people hold offshore accounts containing 32 trillion dollars. And half of that amount is owned by just 100,000 people. They surely are the super, super rich. It's thought that half a trillion dollars has left Russia since 1990. And so the tax on that money has not been invested in the home country. In sub-Saharan Africa, if governments there had been able to tax the many hundreds of billions sent abroad, it would have been enough to pay off their crippling debts. Despite the criticism it can attract, the process is legal and is used on a daily basis by banks around the world. Well, tax loopholes and tax havens are exploited by multinationals and the super-rich to avoid paying high taxes. If tax evasion is a crime, tax avoidance aims to pay the minimum possible without still breaking the law. Among the recent high-profile cases is the British comedian Jimmy Carr, who in one scheme managed to shelter $5.2 million a year. Prime Minister David Cameron described the comedian's arrangements as morally wrong. But when French President Francois Hollande pledged to tax the super-rich at 75%, Cameron invited wealthy French individuals to emigrate to the UK in order to avoid the tax. As for the companies in the United Kingdom, Vodafone and the Topshop Arcadia Group are also accused of avoiding tax. Topshop's owner has been criticised for living in a tax haven and still using public services, but without wanting to pay for them. Another recent case is how the world's most profitable technology company sidestepped paying billions in taxes. Apple was a pioneer of an accounting technique known as the double Irish with a Dutch sandwich. It reduces taxes by routing profits through Irish subsidiaries in the Netherlands and then to the Caribbean. Today, that tactic is used by hundreds of other corporations. So, why do tax havens exist and should they continue to exist? To answer that question and many others, we're joined by our guests in Geneva. Jean-Pierre Dizerend is a General Secretary of the Convention of Independent Financial Advisors. Also in Geneva, Mirat Zaki, and she is a best-selling financial author who wrote Banking Secrecy is Dead, Long Live the Tax Evasion. She's also the deputy editor of the financial magazine Bilan. And in Brussels, Sony Kapoor is a managing director of Redefine, an international think tank that advises governments and policymakers on economic and financial sector policy. Welcome to all of you. But uh, I'm going to start with Mirat Zaki. $21 yeah. trillion dollars is being hidden in offshore bank accounts. Is there any evidence of illeg illegality by cooperations and corporations and rich individuals there? Well, uh, first, I need to say that there is a double standard. Uh, Switzerland has no longer the right to hide offshore assets, at least from Europe and the US. But in other places like the Delaware and Wyoming US states, like Jersey and Guernsey, things are totally different. There is much financial opacity there and still many offshore accounts that are allowed to be there. And when you talk about illegality, well, I would say that tax avoidance, if it is aggressively done, it can fringe on tax evasion. And if it is aggressive tax evasion, it can fringe on tax fraud. So, you know, it is a continuum. And uh, there is much subjectivity and arbitrariness in judging what is legal and illegal. But I would say that in any case, I deem it rather illegitimate. That's for sure. There is too much of that money uh, get going out of countries. And I believe it is never g coming back because it has enjoyed so much 
such top-level financial advice and it is structured in such complex and sophisticated Anglo-Saxon uh, entities that it's very difficult to detect and to dismantle. Oh, it says the Anglo-Saxons' fault, is it? Jean-Pierre Dissarens, uh, you heard what Mazzaki had to say, uh, more illegitimate than illegal. What's your view? Are offshore banks and their customers doing anything wrong? Uh, well, what the offshore banks and their customers are doing is using the law and, to a certain extent, abusing the law, which the Anglo-Saxon structures gives them entirely the possibility to do. So if we're talking about people trying to pay less taxes, taxes is just an expense on your P&L. And if you legally, through uh, complicated structures, can save money to have that money invested in other things than just paying off governments who have managed their accounts in a terrible way over the last 20 years and reinvest that money in productive industry and they use the legal way to do it, so uh, be it, you know. Uh, what we have to know is that there are two things in the offshore money. There is the money, I think, that has been earned honestly in honest business. And then there is another part of money that's much darker, and that's the money of organized crime. And I believe that right now, when we look at what is happening with the governments, the governments ultimately are trying, because of their dramatic mismanagement of public funds, trying to recuperate the money they have willingly let go into right. tax havens by not accusing themselves for having let this go, but by accusing those companies who have taken the benefit that was offered the, the, to the, them. Of hiding their money. Sonny Kapoor, you're sitting in Brussels. What do Europe's major policy makers of offshore tax havens and tax avoidance there? Uh, well, before I go into that, I think, I, I, if you don't mind, I'd just like to comment on what's been said. I think it's very appropriate to say that there are shades of grey. There's a whole spectrum from uh, tax avoidance to tax fraud. And there's also, it's also true that there's legitimate wealth which is undertaxed and there's criminal wealth. Uh, that having been said, there are two elements that are common to this whole discussion, and those two elements are uh, there are regimes that have uh, low tax rates, zero to very low tax rate. Uh, many of the tax havens have zero. Uh, um, Ireland has 12.5%. Um, and the second very crucial element is secrecy. And it's the combination of these two that actually makes tax havens very attractive destinations for money that is tax avoiding tax evasion, for criminal enterprises, for corrupt so, proceeds, exactly. including dictators from third so world countries. So what would you do, Sony? What so would Brussels these are do? All what would Brussels do? Would they make them less secret? Would they make them more well, accountable? I'd... Do you say to the Cayman Islands? Do you say to Liechtenstein, Switzerland, um, Bermuda? OK, you've got to open your books to us. Yes. So there's several things that can be done. One is what you can do at the source. And several countries have taken some steps. So there have been cases in the United Kingdom where the government has forced banks to reveal the names of their offshore clients. That's one step that could be replicated. The second thing is tackle the intermediaries. It's the financial service providers, accounting firms, legal firms, as well as banks. And the HSBC case is an example. By making Making the financial intermediaries liable, you significantly choke the flow of such money. And the third is action against tax havens. And the U.S. has demonstrated some advantage of this. The U.S. is punching its economic weight to get islands such as the Cayman Islands and with the UBS deals, countries such as Switzerland, to take a much more cooperative approach. The European Union has failed to do that, where every country is trying to act on its own, and it doesn't 
doesn't help or that Luxembourg and Austria are tax havens of their own nature. So we need a collective response where the threat of sanctions, of choking off flows to these countries is enough to ensure more compliance and cooperation. OK, well, let's have a look uh, at, at tax havens, that issue, uh, seems to raise it. And then, uh, Marit, we'll come to you for an answer. We, we spoke to the economist John Christensen from the Tax Justice Network, an organisation which is, as you all know, fiercely critical of tax havens. In many cases, it's the politicians and their cronies and their families and so on, and the business people who sponsor the, the political parties who are using these offshore services themselves. So, so they've got no personal interest in closing it down. If they wanted to close it down, they could do it tomorrow. You know, it's not a, a question of rocket science. It's not difficult to do that. All they have to do is to improve information exchange between countries. They can require uh, disclosure of information about offshore accounts, offshore companies, offshore trusts. The fact of the matter is they don't want to do it because they themselves are complicit with the process. Mira Zaki, uh, let's bring you in uh, on this one. Yeah. Uh, tax systems are, are complex and what is acceptable may not mm -hmm. always be clear. And we've just heard from Sony Kapoor yes. asking for more transparency. Is that likely? Yes. No, well, there is considerable limitations to this uh, very uh, honest policy that he um, recommends. First, there is the double standards issue. The fact that the Caribbean and Florida uh, tax havens and Wyoming and Delaware uh, and Nevada are places that are protected by the U.S. government. They don't want to touch these places. So that even nowadays, they remain opaque and they refuse to exchange information with countries such as Britain. Brazil or Mexico, uh, whom uh, taxpayers are evading towards the U.S. Uh, shores. Uh, the second issue is that there are certain entities that are totally escaping nowadays any kind of information exchange. And I think of the international trust. There are types of international trust, such as the discretionary and uh, irrevocable trust and foundation of the foundations of the same kind. Those structures are very expensive and are so difficult to uh, uh, detect and uh, to identify and to trace back to the beneficiary that you simply cannot exchange any type of information. They escape all the treaties and, and conventions that have been signed and between countries so that if you're a big wealthy family and you put your money there, there's no uh, amount of government investigation and power that will be able to detect those uh, and entities. And I have concrete examples of extremely rich French families who have organized their wealth uh, in such a way using several multi-jurisdictions, actually, and you can never find them back. So, um, unfortunately, um, first, there is the w lack of willingness that John Christensen right. uh, said, and Mr. Kapoor said that we could really find ways to make them discover close uh, those jurisdictions, but there, are really, there is real secrecy there, financial secrecy, not banking secrecy, financial secrecy surrounding those entities in the Caribbean and Pacific jurisdiction and Asian, Asian jurisdictions well, that make it impossible to apply those um, transparency policies. OK, well, we're looking at the big banks uh, as well, but Jean-Pierre Dizarens, um, I wonder if you think, I mean, does anybody know how much you earn? Uh, probably not, because you're not going to tell people how much you earn. Money is a very private issue, and you're not going to get governments or banks releasing details of individual accounts, are you? Well, you know, the privacy issue is uh, certainly something where wealthy people will always defend, because... Uh, right now in this uh, world, to be rich can be very dangerous, and uh, one has to be very careful when they have money. Don't forget that uh, rich people have been the targets of uh, defamation over the last uh, years. We hear, you know, we yeah, attack, but everybody attacks rich people. And why well, that, that's jealousy. That's normal. Attack. You always attack rich people because you're jealous they've got so much money. But the point <laughs> is, nobody is going to uh, release information. And the, 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 the tax havens are not accountable to anybody, are they? Well, the tax havens, um, 
you know, is it is it correct to say tax havens? Um, well, that's what they are. Isn't it? Uh, is it, isn't it a financial safe haven where people can uh, direct their investments uh, the way they feel they can do it? Uh, best do it for themselves and for the future of uh, the money they have earned honestly. And I like to insist on the term honestly, because we have to be very careful not to mix the criminal money with the money that has been generated from uh, uh, well this is this is this is a very uh, important point uh, jean pierre because how can you tell down there in the vaults which money has come from money laundering and which money has come from somebody's piggy bank somewhere uh, somebody's savings uh, sony kapoor uh, yes, just on that point, I think this this is an argument that is often used by people who support tax havens that, you know, there's a security issue. It may be that rich people in Colombia or Mexico face some problems, but that doesn't justify the existence of, uh, of, say, of tax havens. The second is, if it is honest money, then by definition, it is not money that is needed to be secreted away in an opaque jurisdiction such as a tax haven. And I'd like to support the point that the previous speaker made, there is definitely a double standard wherein banking secrecy is targeted and jurisdictions such as Delaware and the City of London, which are equally complicit. It's a problem that afflicts both. So when I mention the policy recommendations that we are talking about, that needs to be applied across the board to banks and non-banks, financial secrecy uh, issues. The fact of the matter is that we are, this is a collective action problem, not too different from tackling climate change. We estimated a few years back that for every additional euro of revenue that a government such as the Cayman Islands earned from being a tax haven, it led to a loss of about 25 euros of tax revenue to legitimate economies, both developed and developing. So one could actually think of a scenario where there's an international agreement that says, OK, you're a small island economy. You can't have you know, too much of a diverse economy. We are going to give you aid. But there's a collective clampdown against this tax haven. The additional tax revenues would be more than enough to compensate the countries that lose out, right. that you know are remote islands in the middle of nowhere. But at the same time, tackle corruption, tackle crime, and tackle the rising problem of inequality. Well, there is there is always a journalistic saying, isn't there? Sort of follow the money, uh, and, and you'll come to sort of where the crime begins. Yes, uh, Mirat Zaki, there are trillions trillions of dollars being secreted abroad in offshore tax havens. That works out, we reckon, on Inside Story, that works out at $280 billion in lost income tax yeah. revenues. And that is a huge exactly. black hole in the world economy. And I'm thinking sort of if all the money from Greece that wasn't paid in taxes, uh, in taxes were, was That's released right. from some of these banks, you wouldn't have a problem. Exactly. Exactly. So this is making the burden on us, the middle class, get even uh, heavier because we but have to pay double tax. It's not just the middle class, is it, uh, Marek? It's, it's also remaining. the working class. If you take that money out of the economy, the it means taxes class. are going to be exactly. high for the people right at the bottom as well. For the, the bottom, maybe they're paying less taxes, but I'd, I'd say that the middle class is paying the heaviest burden because they earn reasonably well, but of course the working class as well, so that the people who are in the real economy, who have honest salaries, are having to pay much uh, more to compensate for the ultra-rich evasion against which we can't do much, you know, because if you're ultra-rich, you can buy yourself basically uh, a license to evade. You have, it's a luxury product nowadays. Evading, getting yourself an offshore trust is a luxury product. So if you have the money to buy it, you'll evade. If you are a medium-sized uh, wealth, you have not really the, the means to evade, so you have to declare. So this is the point now. So there is an enormous uh, uh, um, parallel market, the market of uh, the wealthiest tax evasion, that is an, a flourishing market, and it is the Anglo-Saxon financial industry that has captured most of it, and also the 
Asian, Asian centers like Hong Kong, so that if uh, London yeah. and Washington and China don't participate in this, this collective uh, talk about tax evasion, nothing can be done. Exactly. And, and These three uh, what, powers what, have what, to when, participate. When we talk about all the, the hidden money going abroad, it's been estimated in Britain that there would be a tumps in the pound reduction in taxes right at the lowest end uh, of, of the country. But Jean-Pierre Desirens, um, you believe uh, that people have a right to uh, tax havens, uh, a human right, but what do you think about the money just sitting there in the vault in these very unequal times when people are very aware of the disparities in wealth and income around them, more aware than any any time before. And don't you suspect that people are going to be gunning for you and gunning for these tax havens? Well, what we, what, you know, what, what I what I see in these discussions, uh, it's regretful. We we just mix everything. You know, the criminal money, the tax avoidance, the 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 the, the, the uh, other taxation, and so on. Now, what what I'd like to say is uh, that uh, that money that doesn't just sit in a vault. You know, that money is invested. That money, if earned honestly, is invested in the real economy, and it is creating jobs. It's just the cost factor of excessive taxation that has been reduced. Now, what do you say if you have money and a president of a country tells you that everything you earn above so much is going to be taxed by 75%? Now, we have to be careful and we have to know who is the owner of the income generated by a creative individual who is creating added value. Who does that added value belong to? Does it belong to the state in which he's a resident or of which he holds a passport? Or does he own that added value and therefore is entitled to dispose of it? Now, I think we have a basic question. And we have to ask, who is the owner of the funds generated by creative minds? And creative minds look at what happened with IT companies, what they have brought. And these people have become immensely rich because they are creative because they create added value. And of course, these people will try to maximize their income and reduce the tax burden. Now, this is not a criminal activity. And Sony Kapoor, uh, we've worked out that um, less than 100,000 people own about $10 trillion worth of wealth, uh, and nations even dwarfs the debts they owe. How much blame for this situation lies at the door once again of the banks because of so much uncertainty in the banking world and rules and tax complexities? Well, what's really not brought out in the discussion is the very strong interlinkage between financial instability and the so-called tax havens. And I can give you an example. I used to trade derivatives. And it's been estimated that between you know a quarter to a third of all the derivatives trade, and we are talking here about $600 trillion every year is in one way or the other linked to efforts to reduce the tax burden. So financial instability and what happened after Lehman collapsed was the it was a mid-sized bank, but it was because nobody else knew which other bank had Lehman-like exposure or which other bank was exposed to Lehman that Lehman's collapse led to the complete collapse of the financial system. And this uncertainty, uh, the same tools which are used, which is the opaque legal tools using tax havens that are used to avoid taxes, are also the tools that have been used to minimize capital requirements to avoid financial regulation. So to the extent that financial uh, instability and tax avoidance and tax evasion go together, this is hugely dangerous. And I think 
saying that banks lie at the heart of the system because no matter whether you're using trust or whether you're using secret bank accounts, it is the banks uh, which eventually channel everything. the money, even if it goes into investment. As the question uh, suggested, everything comes back to the banks, doesn't it? There is a saying, there are only two certainties in life, death and taxes. Until now, of course, unless, of course, you are a major corporation or you have very expert tax advisors. Thank you to our guests in Geneva, Jean-Pierre Desirens, also in Geneva, Mirat Zaki, and in Brussels, Sonny Kapoor, and thank you very much for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. If you want to send us your feedback, just email your thoughts to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. Thanks for watching from me, Stephen Cole. Goodbye. <laughs>